So, M21 came out a little while ago, and with it came Basri Ket. Something about a sand paladin intrigued me, and I wanted to learn more about his home plane, Amon Ket. I've got myself a Kindle recently, so I did something that I don't usually do. Instead of reading wiki summaries, I read the actual fiction for Amon Ket in full. And they seem to me deserving of more attention. This isn't a Basri Ket video, and it isn't an Amon Ket story video either, though some of that does have to come up, as you'll see. On this channel, we're world builders at heart, and I want to talk about world building. Amonkhet is an especially weird kind of setting. It's not just an oddball in terms of magic sets or fantasy, it's one of a kind in fiction. If you're a fan of Magic the Gathering, then I'm positive this video will tell you things you never knew about the plane of gods and deserts, and if you're a fan of world building, you owe it to yourself to see what a truly inspired creative team knocking it out of the park looks like. You're watching Building Better Dungeons. Let's talk Amonkhet. Part 1. City in the Sands Amonkhet has several quirks, and one of them is that all intelligent life resides in the city of Naktomon. Now, Naktomon gets royally wrecked at the end of this story, leading many to theorize that we might see other cities in Amonkhet after all, with other gods, and that the people of Naktomon were mistaken when they thought that their city was all that remains. But unfortunately, from the short stories The Hand That Moves and Hour of Revelation, we learn that there really are only ever eight gods, and the Nactamon really is all that was left. So that's not an option for us, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Amonkhet is a plain full of terror, death, and danger in the desert. The curse of wandering afflicts the entire plain. And that means that those that die rise as evil zombies intent on dealing more death. Even those things that live in the desert, the horrors, the dragons, the sandworms, are all deadly, terrifying, and ferocious, and they've laid waste to all other cities on the plain. The five gods of Amonkhet reside in Naktamon. Oketra, god of solidarity, with Ronis, god of strength, serve as a strike force, taking down the bigger threats before they can even arrive near the city. And Kefnet, god of wisdom, creates a powerful magical force field that keeps out all of the lower level ambient threats, like zombies and hellions, and that's called the Hekma. You've heard that right, Amonkhet has gods and they walk among the people, though we'll discuss them in further detail in just a moment. Put a little pin in that one. Life is given to the city of Naktamon by the Luxa River, which runs straight through it. It's apparently big enough to house multiple sea serpents, which is alright, seems a bit extra mate. The people of Amonkhet actually don't have to do most of the work involved in running a city. They don't cook, they don't clean, they don't build, they don't raise children, and I love that for them. The Anointed do all that. Amonkhet's take on mummies, the Anointed are the corpses of any who die in the trials, and they are controlled by the living via the means of magical cartouches. What are the trials? Well, get a second pin out for that one, but suffice to say for now, anyone not actively attempting to compete in these trials is doing work that a mummy couldn't do. They are the Viziers, a class of people who work with the five gods of Amonkhet to teach initiates, help the gods with the spiritual health of the citizens of Naktamon, and do anything that requires a bit more creative problem solving than a corpse could do. We don't actually see much of the Viziers in their story or what their responsibilities are, but we know from what we see of Hepatra that much of their work involves teaching classes to the initiates to help them succeed in the trials. But the city of Naktamon would be literal dust in the desert if it weren't for... Part 2. Gods Among Us one of the most striking things about Amonkhet is its unique take on faith. The five gods of Amonkhet don't really need much from the people. They are natural manifestations of Amonkhet itself, and they live to protect the people. Oketra, the cat-headed god of solidarity, preaches truth, unity, and togetherness. Kefna, the ibis-headed god of wisdom, preaches scholarship, cleverness, and the art of spellcasting. Bantu, crocodile-headed god of ambition, preaches seizing opportunity, becoming strong, and tests the willingness to do what one must. Hazaret, jackal-headed god of zeal, preaches emotion, devotion, and judgment. Finally, Ronus, snake-headed god of strength, preaches indomitable will, self-reliance, and power, both physical and mental. These gods walk among the people of Naktamon, assisting in matters both spiritual and practical. But even they are nothing compared to the god pharaoh, the great being who created even the gods, absent now, but still felt in his present on Amonkhet's culture and architecture. These buildings are built to resemble his horns. All of life on Naktamon is built on pleasing the god pharaoh, 
who has graced Amonkesh with its dual suns, the second one of which marks the hours until he shall return, when it reaches the zenith between these two giant horns. And because of these two suns, Amonkhet is always blessed by radiant daylight. It is never nighttime here. The god pharaoh has created Amonkhet as a staging ground for the best of the best to prove themselves worthy to enter the paradise that he has created. Life on Amonkhet is temporary and it is harsh, and so citizens prepare dutifully for the next. Every day is spent on training and honing one's body and mind for the five trials, so that when the god pharaoh returns and the five hours take place, they may be found worthy. What are the hours? Get your third pin out for that one. Speaking of pins, and speaking of trials... Part 3. What is life for? On Amonkhet, those who die are cursed to live on a half-life as zombies. This is actually a natural effect of the plane, an unfortunate imbalance in the ley lines causes ambient necromancy to take such forms, and for the people of Amonkhet, this is the worst fate imaginable, to shamble forever in eternal torment. It serves as excellent motivation for them to try the trials, for even if they fail, they become the respected anointed who will serve those who succeed in paradise. A better fate than the curse of wandering, anyhow. Those who do succeed in the trials, however, are exalted as truly worthy of the god pharaoh's favour. Each of the five gods has created a trial to test their own domain and the initiate's mastery of it. Children train from birth, and though some are chosen to become viziers to oversee the process, most aim to die nobly in the trials after succeeding or failing, so as to move on to a better life. At an early age, initiates of the trials are put together in crops, as if to be harvested, where they train to do the trials, learning each other's strengths and weaknesses, and becoming a team, siblings in arms. The first trial is organized by Oketra to test Initiate's ability to work together. It involves working as a team to retrieve one of Oketra's arrows whilst defending an obelisk of their own construction from hordes of angels, mummies, horrors, and the likes. Initiates who pass are considered to have mastered teamwork and solidarity. The second trial is organized by Kefnet, and it's the Trial of Knowledge, which involves navigating a magical maze that dulls instinct and emotions and tortures the Initiates with illusions that take the form of their worst fears. Passing through this test proves you to be capable of solving problems with raw intellect alone. The third trial is the Trial of Strength, organized by Ronus. Magic doesn't help you here. Initius must climb a wall of thrones that is laced with poison that saps magical ability and is also very toxic and will kill them. The Initiates must face all manners of beasts to make their way to a basilisk, slay it, and use its scales to make an antidote. Initiates who pass this test prove themselves to be capable of overcoming severe obstacles with just physicality. The fourth trial is the Trial of Ambition, and it's organized by Bantu. Initiates must make their way through a veritable death house of the crocodile god's creation. They face dangerous traps, vile beasts, and each other. For the trial is designed so that some members of the crop are expected to willingly sacrifice themselves for the good of the others. At the end, if too many of the initiates survive, they are expected to kill each other and present a heart of their dearest friend and fellows to Bantu herself. Initiates who pass through this trial can be trusted to do what must be done, no matter what it takes. The last trial is the Trial of Zeal, and it is more of a victory lap than anything else. Hazaret chooses a new foe each time for the initiates to die in a beautiful battle against. Sometimes the foes are dangerous dragons, horrific hellions, or decidedly manticores. On one notable occasion, the initiates were pitted against some lad and his four loser friends. That one must have seemed a little lackluster, especially because it was the last one ever. Initiates who survive are slain by Hazaret herself, and enter paradise as the most venerated of heroes. This is what awaits almost everyone on Amonkhet, with the anointed taking care of everything they need. All they must do is hone themselves into the perfect warriors for the god pharaoh, but not all go willingly. Chapter 4. Descent. Unsurprisingly, the human survival instinct is difficult to really snuff out. Though the gods and their divinity cannot be doubted, the god pharaoh's designs are so grim that sometimes even people in Nakdamun have doubts. Doubting a little is healthy, even supported by the gods. All the better to test your faith. But descent? Voicing real and tangible disbelief in the will of the god pharaoh, that's a fate to be punished the worst way possible. Angels shove the centers into sarcophagi, carry them out to the desert where they are dropped and perish and are taken by the curse of wandering. 
but people still dissent and they do so for all kinds of reasons. We see one couple whose love for each other surpasses their respect for the god pharaoh, and so they plan to descend together, to elope and somehow survive out in the desert. We also see that not all is quite perfect in Nakhtamon. Buildings with the god pharaoh's horns adorning them are noticeably newer than older buildings, and remnants of imagery of eight gods, not just five, are everywhere for those willing to look, hidden just beneath the surface. Some chunks of the ruins noticeably label the god pharaoh with the word trespasser, these clues and more lead the clever and the devoted alike to sometimes realize that not all is well on Nakhtamun, but of course they have to be careful who they tell, lest they be dragged into the desert by wicked winged angels. Little details add up. The angels, twisted and unhappy as they are, are clearly beings that used to be something else, molded now into the god pharaoh's image. Sphinxes, beings with minds immutable to mental manipulation, don't speak a word, beset by the god pharaoh's curse of silence. All is not well on Amonkhet, not by a long shot. Chapter 5, Devastation One detail we mentioned earlier is the fact that the God Pharaoh has an explicit return date, demarcated by a sun that serves as a calendar for that exact purpose. The people of Nakhtamon wait fervently for the hours, where the viziers and the young, and those who haven't completed the trials, will be given an opportunity to prove themselves worthy yet of paradise, where the Hekma will fall, as it is no longer needed, and where the doorway to the next life will open, and all that are worthy will be let in. Up until this point, we've been describing the Amonkhet that casual players are probably familiar with. The city in the sands, protected by the Hekma, watched over by the five gods, everyone completing in the five trials. And that's all evocative enough. But what makes Amonkhet especially interesting is how ephemeral it all is. The place we've just described to you is forever changed now. Because when the five hours do arrive, Paradise does not. Instead, on that fated day, a foul demon emerges from the gates of Paradise, using its own blood in a ritual that turns the Luxor red and congealed. The gates of the afterlife, now open, shows not a Paradise, but a grim necropolis behind, where three gods emerge, each with their own sacrilege to commit. The people watch in horror as the scorpion god begins to kill their divine protectors. They gasp in terror as the locust god sets his progeny on the Hekma, devouring it and allowing the monsters outside to spill in. They scream in pure grief as the scarab god shows them what has really happened to the past champions who completed the trials. Now, coated in a blue metal lazatep, they are nothing more than perfect mindless killing machines. Zombies called the Eternals. And kill they do. They are set immediately upon the people of Nakhtamun. For Amonkhet was not always as it is now. Long ago, the plane had eight gods, each determined to protect their people, when something greater than a god came to visit. Nicol Bolas, planeswalker and almost omnipotent, had just been the victim of a great and terrible tragedy that was robbing him of that godlike omnipotence. With just days of his power remaining, he beset upon Amonkhet, destroying three of the eight gods, reworking the memories of the remaining five so that they would believe him to be their creator and transforming the plane in his image and for his purposes. Every person on Nakhtamon old enough to walk was murdered, and the rest were raised by the anointed as the first wave of initiates and viziers. Nakhtamon is no mere city. It is a factory that creates Eternals, these powerful zombie warriors for use in Nicol Bolas' personal army. The trials, the gods, and every person on this plane and everything that they have ever done was all for this singular purpose. Their entire life, a lie. There are two reactions that one can have when faced with truth like this. Like the Jeru, ardent believer, you can snap, simply failing to reconcile the horrible reality with the lies you have been raised on. Or, like Samut, voice of dissent, you can grit your teeth, stand up against unstoppable evil, and do your damned best to inconvenience it. Bose did not imagine that any on Amonkhet were deserving of his attention. He assumed they would all simply fold, spirits broken when they realized their lives were a lie. But in truth, the real story of Amonkhet is about human perseverance. Well, not just human, there were also, like, minotaurs and bird people, uh, but yeah, it's about perseverance. The citizens of Nakhtamun have been forged into perfect, ardent warriors by the trials, and not all go down easily. Some fight, and against the odds, some survive. Shockingly. Samot and Dejero even lead a ragtag group of resistance fighters to make a stand and protect Hazaret, the lone surviving god of Nakhtamun, from the Scorpion God. They trap it long enough for the god of Zeal to burn it to a crisp and give it a release in fire. And that might all sound like nothing really, 
The city of Nakdamun has been destroyed. Four of the five gods were killed. Everyone's life was revealed to be a lie, and generations of needless death have been perpetuated. But Amonkhet and the story there is all about how important small things can be. Years later, when Amonkhet is visited by powerful beings who can walk between worlds in search of assistance in a war against the god pharaoh, Hazaret lends her spear and her wisdom, and both are essential in the blows against Nicobolus that eventually defeat him. And Hazaret would not be around to give that wisdom if it weren't for the work of two people, Samot and Dejero, who decide that their city, their home, is worth fighting for, even against impossible odds. Amonkhet's role in the grander story of Magic the Gathering is small, but it is crucial. Sometimes in life, power structures exist that are not good, that are not just, and that seem completely immovable. It seems that everyone around you isn't even willing to consider any alternatives. It seems like the whole world is set in stone, and all we can do is pound our fists against it and wail like children standing against a god. But as on Amonkhet, people can and do make a noticeable difference. Together, they can make all the difference. Besieged on all sides by horrors beyond imagining, realizing that the things that they had believed their entire life weren't true, those that managed to persevere made a small difference that changed the course of history. Remember that every time tyrants were toppled and good prevailed, the beginning was small, and it was local, and it was personal. Sometimes all it takes is 99 theses nailed to a church door to change the face of religion forever. Sometimes all it takes is tossing a little tea into a harbor to change the fate of an entire nation. And sometimes all it takes is that someone voices a little dissent. And we could all use a little more dissent in our lives. These videos are brought to you with the help of our wonderful patrons, which includes the generous Talaris. I hope you're all staying safe out there, and yeah, safe home.